Let's do a final business before you get to the weekend. 55 minutes of going around the world of business. That's what we promise you here on Business Incorporated. And here are the stories and discussions that we have for you. That local government autonomy in Nigeria is still a big deal. And we're looking at expectations and how it will affect the structure. And uh, Uganda coffee may have a boost, that's the export, after they have an agreed with the EU's guidelines. Egypt's government is trying to raise more funds and they're looking at asset liquidation. Welcome to the program. I'm Ini John Mekwa. We start as usual from the global oil space. Prices inched up on Friday amid signs of easing inflationary pressures in the United States as the world's biggest oil consumer, although Brent crude was set for a weekly decline. Brent crude features rose 49 cents, that's about 0.6% to $85.69 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude features climbed 58 cents, that's about 0.7% to $83.20 a barrel. Both benchmarks gained in the prior two sessions, but were still poised for weekly declines. Brent features were set to fall about 1% week on week following four weekly gains. WTI features were broadly stable on a weekly basis. And Festus' confidence was bolstered after data showed that U.S. consumer prices fell in June, stoking hopes that the Federal Reserve will cut interest rates soon. The market, however, is still awaiting clearer signs of action from the Fed Chair, Jerome Paul, who acknowledges the recent improving trend in price pressures. Staying in that space, but in Nigeria, the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission and related parties say they have agreed on a sustainable template to resolve the lingering inability of oil producers to adequately supply local refineries crude feed stock. A statement from the NUPRC indicates that this was resolved after a meeting where they shared commitment to working towards a viable supply of crude oil to Nigeria's refineries on the market-determined pricing system. The issue of pricing for local crude sold to refineries in Nigeria had remained a major problem, with Dangote Refinery recently accusing the international oil companies of having a markup price of as much as 56% over normal rates. Consequently, the industry regulator, NUPRC, directed oil refiners in the country to provide monthly price quotes on crude supply to ensure a more seamless process. Well, we are still staying around the oil and gas areas. Nigerians are yet to see the gains of subsidy removal, although allocation to the three tiers of government has increased. This comes to the four SQs resurfaced at many petrol stations across Nigeria. The country pilot of trade grid, Mr. Jide Pratt, who was a guest on Business Morning today, says the lack of transparency and subsidy removal management has given an unfavorable perspective. Is gone. When the president said subsidy was gone, and let's put it in perspective, if you did some calculations then, we probably were paying a subsidy of about 50 or 54 naira per liter. That's not the same today. Today we're probably paying about 200 naira or more per liter. And uh, I mean, those are my personal opinions based on what I see. So what are the gains that we've gotten? And in all fairness to the president and his team, they seem to be getting the CNG in the initiative right. So this is the question. If they had been, had been a bit more transparent, then what it meant is that from May 29th, 2003, there should have been someone on the, government, on the government side saying that this is how much we have saved to month on month. And this is where it's going to. That way, we'll begin to say that, look, the pains that we're going through now are not, uh, what you would call it, they're not long-term. So it means that how many CNG buses have been put on stake between May 29, 2023 and now? How many, uh, what you would call it, renewable units have been built into people's houses in terms of cost of power? So let's get off the oil space now and go to metals. Gold prices edged low on Friday, but we're headed for a third straight week of gains. As cooler than expected, U.S. inflation data boosted hopes of the Federal Reserve cutting interest rates 
in September. Spot gold slipped 0.2%, $2,409.19 per ounce after rising 2% on Thursday. U.S. gold features eased also 0.3% to $2,414.10. Data on Thursday, of course, showed that easing of inflation in the United States and that is a major driver for this uh, price movement. Spot silver, on the other hand, fell 0.8% to $31.18 per ounce after scaling an over one month high. On Thursday, platinum etched 0.1% lower, $1,003.25. Palladium dropped also, all in red, we see 1.3% to $982.44. Both metals were set to register weekly declines. Key metal consumer China, their exports rose 8.6% in June from a year earlier, and imports unexpectedly shrank 2.3%. And this is according to their national data. Now, maximizing the over 1 billion market as available in Africa was the motivation for creating the African Continental Free Trade Area. AFCFTA. However, with a seemingly slow progress, the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, has decided to push the women to the center of the workings through her after. Giving a face to the African Continental Free Trade Area, AFCFTA, six years after it was founded, is the mission here. Conversations have been planned towards the theme, breaking barriers, positioning women to harness Africa's trade opportunities. A, a woman who is running a business, about 80% of her profit goes into back into social activities. We can't say the same for the men, right? It is data that exists. When you invest in a woman's business, you are investing in social impact. Her AFCFTA comes to say the center, the heart and soul of this AFCFTA, the face of it has to be the face of a woman. So I, I serve on the IC board of uh, a fund, uh, Alithia Idea Fund. A fireside chat with a four-member panel, did, one of them, the chief executive officer so of the chair center group, Mr. Bukwa Wushika, takes the conversation further with a focus on maximizing AFCFTA, mobilizing private like sector finance for women-led um, enterprises. If you go to even a country like UAE, it's an Arab world and you're thinking men are very much more patriarchal than here. But if you buy a property in Dubai, and you, say, you buy it Mr. and Mrs. The title document comes as Mr. So, your husband, 50% categorically written, and Mrs. So, the wife, 50% categorically written. Interesting. Not Mr. and Mrs., because Mrs. can be any Mrs. Mm. <laughs> but Mrs., first name, middle name, date of birth, and her shareholding is specific. So now that gives you a sense of ownership that in the effect that you do need to work with those kind of titles, you do have access. The launch of her AFCFTA in collaboration with the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, along with other participants in the trade and investment space in Nigeria, begins in practice by creating a platform for women to exhibit their work. Africa trades only 16.6% amongst itself. So trading is about jobs, it's about livelihoods, it's about revenue. And we feel very strongly that the role of women in the implementation of uh, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area is great and is very important. It's an imperative. While the focus here is women, organizers say the bigger picture is to increase intra-African trade to boost job opportunities and economic indices of countries on the continent. Well, you know, business has to contribute to that local government autonomy uh, judgment, which was given yesterday. Uh, I know you've seen it on Sunrise Daily. You've seen it on Morning Brief. It's time to see it on business and see the business uh, perspective to that. And so we have uh, joining us for that conversation a former uh, chairman uh, of Amuadof in local government area, Mr. Ayodile Adewale in the studio to find out what to expect, uh, Mr. Adewale. Thank you so much for your time. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Great. So, um, 
I think uh, almost everybody is excited about this. Maybe not everybody. Maybe some states are not very excited about the state government, you know, uh, because that means that they may no longer have the control over local government. I use that uh, very consciously, the may, because... Um, we know how things can run in this country. We can have one thing on paper, and yet we do not truly really have that autonomy. Uh, you've been there, so you'll be speaking at least from a first-hand experience. Um, do you think this judgment will give local government areas or local governments in the country um, the autonomy in the real sense of it? Well, it's a landmark judgment. It's very historic, and uh, it will help the local government to grow in accordance to their peculiarities and capacities. Though capacity still need to be improved in order for the funds to be spent judiciously, uh, I can liken it to the proverbial uh, talents that were given in the Bible at different ratio. Some increase it well, some increase it exponentially, while some just kept it the way it is. So for me, it is not just the uh, a direct allocation that matters, but one is uh, to account for those monies appropriately well. Let us see it in terms of the deliverables, uh, infrastructural provision and all whatnot, uh, creation, creating uh, more robust opportunities that will transform the local economy for production and, and for growth. Uh, we expecting that that would uh, help to appreciate the president and the attorney general and the judiciary for creating this uh, avenue for local government to have direct uh, fund stream to, to their environment. Mm. So how does this affect the structure, the working structure? Um, because some people have said, well, if we really want this to work, we have to first of all look at how the local government chairman or LCDA chairman are being, you know, how they get into power, the election or, or, or selection, you know, of it. So how does this affect um, that structure? And what do you see as the relationship between the state and local government after this judgment? To your first question, there are two realities, right? The first reality is the, uh, the fund. And the second reality is how the local government hemsmen are elected into office. Uh, but for me, it depends primarily on, on their constituency, on their constituency, on the electorate. Uh, they need to do more by coming out to elect uh, people who have capacity. And uh, the intriguing part of uh, local governance is that whoever that is elected into office lives among the people. Right, So the people already know who you are. They know what you can do. So the people more have been given the powers you know, to make and unmake uh, their future, as the case is. Then the civil society also have a lot to do because there is this apathy, especially at the grassroots, uh, prior to now. And uh, civil society organization must come to help to mirror the character and the personality of whoever that intend, you know, to contest election and to gain power. Because I often tell people that uh, the easiest person to deceive anybody in a political interface are those people who are just coming into power. They will tell you, I can do, I will do, and all of that. You've not been able to aggregate and adjudge them. Uh, but for those who are in power, you can immediately see what they've been able to do within the little time they are spent in office, and that will determine on whether the people will renew their mandate or not. But basically, people right now must take local government uh, 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 system more seriously, knowing fully well that they are the first responder in a political environment. Mm, you know, you said that because uh, the local government chairman is supposed to be living among the people. Definitely. That is how it's supposed to be. But we do know in many cases, it doesn't, it's, it, that's not what is applicable at this time. And um, uh, the thing is, the local government chairman and leadership 
before now seem to be invisible, but there, there are some responsibilities allocated to them. I think things like managing the wage, uh, the waste, and all of that with the state in Lagos. I wonder how that's going to work. See, seeing that Lagos state government, the state itself, is is very active in that. But tell us now that um, they should have their fund directly to them. What should we expect as the people from the local government? Well, driving to your first question, they've never been invisible. They've always been there. It is the consciousness of people that have not been opined to their existence. Uh, I have been in the local government since, I've been living in Amu or Dauphin, for instance, since 1978, and I'm still living there. I've never for one day think living outside of the local government. And uh, to your other question is that, like I said, it is the, about the people. Uh, the local government is always there. The people transverse in front of the local government council. And uh, because of the fact that a lot of these local government are not adding value to the lives uh, and the existence of their constituents, and that is why they do not have any recall, I mean, reason to, to move towards them. But now that the fund has come and the fund will be going directly to them, the only uh, organization that I believe can help the people, you know, bringing them closer to the local government is the civil society and the media. The more the media tends to showcase the existence and the ability and inability of this local government, the more civil society tends to organize a various forum for people to sit and discuss about the happenings of the local government, the better for those communities. Take, for instance, an agro community, whereby all they have is just landmass, and they are getting uh, a location from the federal. One would think that that local government will concentrate more on agri and concentrate, secondly, to infrastructure. Because from the agri engagement, they can increase their avenue of generating more funds. Uh, they should not rely on whatever they get from local government, from the state government and the federal government. But they should think out of the box. How do we grow the local economy? How do we improve on the security of lives and property? How do we provide opportunities, right? I would think that local government that are uh, domiciled within cosmopolitan area will be focusing toward more on tech right, and sustaining the infrastructure they have within their jurisdiction. Why local governments that are also bordering, say, the sea and the river will be concentrating more on ocean economy in order to provide more opportunities, amenities, and grow whatever resources they've been able to amass. But there must be a common denominator, and the common denominator is one, first line charge, salaries. Before you embark, on using the money for whatever uh, adventure, you know, you want to, I mean, spend money on, you must plug off staff salary of staff and teachers, teachers, uh, uh, primary school teachers, because that's the sole responsibility of the local government. You must also be able to pay pension, right? Because in the past, a lot of the local government chairmen are not focusing or did not focus towards that. They will rather focus on some gigantic project that has no direct uh, impact on their people. Why some of them will go for huge loans, and these loans are tied to their to their allocation. So as the money is coming, the banks are taking the funds, mm. and at the end of the day, there's nothing. Yeah, on ground. yeah. Of course, I was, uh, we, we, and we've heard this conversation many, many times talking about the allocation. So we see for me, for instance, that the local government had. Um, 293.8 billion. So that gives us an idea, you know, of what they have. Um, they, they say the funds are too small. What do you think, or how effective can a local government be with this level of fund, speaking from experience? For me, no fund is small. No fund is small. It is what you are able to do with those funds. We have seen people who have become billionaires from just a little enablement of a uh, few thousands of naira or a few hundreds of naira. It is the idea that matters. If you are coming into office, you must come with a program. 
The program one is to guarantee the safety of your, of your people and provide security and enabling environment. The second is the welfare of your people. Welfare also includes education, includes job opportunities, and includes other sundry matters like healthcare and what have you. Those are your primary objectives, right? Now, the last front of it is how do I also plow this fund into something that is meaningful so that I can build more avenue of fund generation, not just concentrate on taxes, right? You must be able to grow your economy you must grow your system. You must educate your people. Because the most lucrative uh, empowerment is education. Either literary education or vocational education. When you educate your people, then your society tends to benefit more. Mm. So what are those avenues available for revenue? You said not just taxes. Yes. I mean, I know education, all those are long-term investments. They are short-term. Oh, really? Yeah, short and, yeah, yeah, depending okay. on the kind of education you're okay, focusing so please, on. Okay, so please do tell us what are some of those avenues available that local government can boost this uh, allocation, you know, to, to touch the lives better. First, you must look at the peculiarity of the local government, right? Let's use where you were now, in local government, Abu in, I'll use Abu Wadhafi as a case study, right? I came in in 2008, and I sat for two terms, and I left in 2014. Mind you, I've had a background of civil society, Right? I've been privileged to sit among the founding fathers of this country, like Chief Enauru. I was mobilization and liaison officer of PRONACO while he was head. I was secretary at the Citizens Forum. Professor Wale Shoenka was chairman. I was secretary to Dr. Bekor and Somkuti. He was chairman of the June 12 coalition. So we have discussed on how we want the Nigerian state to look like and how we want it to be. So I came into the local government with my programs, right? I met one doctor. I partnered with the NYC and I partner with the military, and I partner with retirees in my community. I increased it to 56 doctors, right? I met about eight nurses. I left there with about 60 nurses, right? I engaged over a thousand non-pensionable workers from education consultants that came in to help me uh, uh, teach models that is required for primary education to some set of core members. I had the highest number of core member deployment in Nigeria. Every core member cycle, I get about 250 core members, right? And I deploy them. My core member doctors, I was paying 100,000 at the Riverine community, 70,000 upland. My engineers were getting 50,000, I mean, lawyers, 50,000. And I guess all this all wasn't this coming thing. from FAC. It was part of FAC, right? But again, I met an IGR of 30,000 per month. October 30th, 2008. But when I left October 30th, 2014, I left an IGR of 24 million naira per month. So we were able to grow the IGR. Share the secret, sir. It's just plugging off waste stages. You plug off waste stages, you concentrate on the reason why you're there. You have consultative meetings with people. I was giving free health. Free health to people at the, at the grassroots. I was giving free delivery. We delivered over 3,000 babies free drugs to people within the age of zero to 16, 60 and above, right? We gave free jam foam to, 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 free 600 jam forms, right? Every year for six years, free 500 GCE forms. Well, I, I, I guess the new local government areas, uh, local government uh, chairman and leadership, they, they, they do have a lot to learn because um, certainly we do need the well, vibrant economy. If they want to learn more, if you permit me, let them go to YouTube, right? Dial, type, comrade, I, or delay, they were a positive impact. You see a documentary that was packaged while I was in government, the first two years of my administration of six years. You get a lot of tips on how to grow the local government governance. All right, thank you so much uh, for your time uh, this afternoon. Former Chairman at a moment of local government, Mr. Adewale, Adewale, thank you. Thank you for having me. Let's take a break now. When we come back, we head to the market. Join us again. Welcome back to watching Business Incorporated on channels, television. We'll head to the markets now with Aniti Edet. Aniti, good afternoon. Yes, I see the market good good has recovered from the drop of yesterday and um, we've gained, I think we've gained about 200 billion so far uh, mm -hmm. compared to what we had this morning at the opening of the trade. 
Yeah, and it, it, quite interesting to note that um, it has been four consecutive days of downturn at the market, uh, at the stock market. And um, yesterday, the market lost about 188.74 billion, and I know thanks to losses from uh, 18 equities led by Seplat. You know, so this figure has, um, although it's climbed back to uh, about uh, just slightly above that uh, figure that it lost on Thursday, but it's still at uh, at a near two weeks low. Uh, so uh, we're still seeing the market trying to make some comeback and at the same time the um, impact of uh, bargain hunting because of course you, you, some, some people might like the bearish side of the market while some might like the bearish part of the, of the market. So uh, for Nigeria's stock market making a little bit of recovery at intraday, this market, these numbers will still be changing as the market is in pro, uh, procession until 2.30 when it closes officially and where we will see if the bulls will maintain their dominance at intraday and make it, make, making it a, uh, maybe a positive close for the, for the second trading week of uh, July for the market. But for South Africa Stock Exchange, uh, the JSC, 0.37%, in the green, and of course, the market has gone above that 80,000 level back into the 81,000 level, which it um, it crossed sometime last week. So that's it for the two uh, giants of uh, on the African continent. And the other sides of the market, we see uh, the EJX 30. Also, uh, well, in the, in the red, so it's quite a mixed picture for uh, African indexes, the key African index, the indexes that we track at intraday. While for Kenya Stock Exchange, it was um, in the red, 0.34%. NSE 20, that's what you call it. So that, mar that market was in the red for the close of Thursday's trading session. Now, we are still with Nigeria's market, financial market, but this time switching over to the fixed income side of the market. What we see for Thursday's uh, closing, we saw uh, the treasury bills, it uh, traded in the bullish territory. For, uh, first of all, the average yield there contracted by 16 basis points to 23.3%, while for the bonds market, we saw bearish uh, movement there. Uh, the average yield there, it expanded by five basis points to 18.9%. For the OMO market, we saw the average yield there dipping by two basis points, so that was a, a, a bullish side for the market. Uh, it dipped by that, that uh, amount to 24.3%. Uh, and of course, where we're still seeing intraday, the market is still moving uh, a bit in, be in between the profit side and the sell-off side. So now let's talk more about the fixed income market, particularly a review of the week and then what to expect for next week where the government will be conducting uh, a bond auction, uh, the first one for the month of July, as well as the inflation numbers. So now to give us more perspective on that, let's bring in Caleb Alimi, the chief dealer at Providence Bank for more information on that. Thank you for joining us, Caleb. Good, um, Okay, so now, uh, my first question. Um, let's start first, uh, just a quick review of uh, the, uh, the fixed income market. So we saw 166 billion, uh, which was the target for the Treasury bills um, auction for, by, by the central bank on behalf of uh, the debt management office. So now, give us details about uh, the activities so far from Monday to Thursday and at intraday. Um, I think where we'll start from will be the interbank liquidity, really. And what has happened as we've seen that all through the week, coming all the way from last week, the liquidity has been extremely tight. We've been hovering around negative 1.5 trillion for you know most of the week. And between Monday and Thursday, we're still around those numbers from negative 1.5 trillion down to Thursday about negative 1.2 trillion. You know, and uh, this morning we're opening with negative um, about 600 and. 600 or something billion, about 660 billion. So we've seen slight improvements over the course of the week in the liquidity situation. And that's why, like you, you know, rightly mentioned before, you've seen bearish sentiments in the bond market throughout the week. And then you've seen, you know, bearish sentiments also in the big treasury bill space. However, just between yesterday and today, we've seen a bit of improvement. And that's largely been because of the auction. You know, so um, we've seen quite a few. Um, investors trying to, you know, um, get some latch on part of the auction. The auction closed higher than expected. Uh, I assume you you reviewed that already. And then we expect intraday so far. What we've seen is just a bit of cherry picking of the yields. We've seen yields, you know, trend slightly lower than where they closed. The auction closed at twenty one point two four. We've we'll seen a lot of trades happen around the twenty point. Uh, 20.80 handle, 20.90 handle, you know, due to demand for the new securities that have just been issued. 
Okay, so now let's uh, switch over to uh, uh, the side of the bond uh, this time. Uh, we, we heard that uh, this, the, the federal government is set up, is seeking to raise about 300 billion uh, from its July 2024 bond auction. And this is about 33% uh, lower than the 450 billion target, uh, which, which, which it had uh, in, in the previous month. And now, so now, what's, um, what's the factor behind this um, a weakening demand for a government bond? Uh, the demand is not weakening per se. What we see is um, a reduction in the issue size from the from the regulator or from the from the issuer, right? Uh, between in the first in the first half of the year, quarter one and quarter two, they were trying to raise about four fifty billion each in in each of the months. But now they've dropped that offer size. That's largely because they seem to have raised uh, officially what their target was, you know. And what we've noticed typically from the debt management office is they front front load their, their borrowings, which we, which has happened this year between, you know, uh, quarter one and quarter two. They front loaded what they, what they needed to raise and they significantly raised from the bond market, you know, um, from bonds alone, a little over, mm -hmm. you know, three trillion, about 3.5 trillion from the market and generally from plus competitive and non-competitive bids, they raised 4.1 trillion from the bond market. So if you look at when their targets from the bond market, they seem to have front-loaded a lot of that in the first half of the year. And that's why we're seeing reduced uh, supply, you know, in the second half of the year. That is expected, like I said, because they front-loaded their, 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 their borrowing. Mm. Okay, Caleb, I think we'll leave it there and also keep our eyes out for uh, the June inflation report, will be, which will be released by the National Bureau of Statistics. And of course, whether that number would come higher or lower, we will we'll get to see that on Monday. Thank you so much for your analysis on our show. Thank you for having me. Let me just quickly mention that just as we're conversing, a publication just came out by the Debt Management Office. The auction for Monday has been shifted to next week, Monday. It's now going to hold on July 22nd and no longer July 15th. Mm. Okay, so thank you so much for that update. And uh, as well, uh, I'm sure our, our investors and uh, viewers are uh, actually keeping an eye on that. Right. So that was Caleb Alimi, Chief Dealer at Providence Bank with the numbers for the fixed income market uh, at intraday and for the week. Now let's go move over to the Middle Eastern market where we see Mixed trade at intraday for the United Arab Emirates indexes, the Abu Dhabi and the Dubai FM. Negative on one side, positive on the other side, intraday numbers, and then the final numbers will be out for the close of the day uh, later uh, in a couple of hours from now. And now over to the other side of the two markets uh, which were closed for Thursday is Saudi Arabia, Tada Wu, 0.07%. In the green, uh, that, that market that closed on Thursday. So that's their closing number. And the Qatari Stock Exchange uh, also in the green, 0.15% uh, uh, positive close for Thursday's trading session. And from the Middle East, we fly over to the United States, where we see, uh, first of all, the stock futures, they open flat, and this is coming after the S&P 500 suffered his worst day, uh, the worst day so far, uh, which was last seen uh, in, in April this year. So the, it was this flattest performance, 0.07% for the Dow Jones Industrial Average, 40,116.00. And the S&P, like we said, which had its worst day, but um, still within that uh, milestone, which it did, it did cross about 5,000, oh, over 5,400 uh, in the green. That's for the stock futures, 0.08%. And for the NASDAQ, 0.01% in the red for the stock futures. And when the, the market is also coming after uh, the, 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 tech, uh, the, the tech stocks had some rotation for, for there. And, and talking about the market, we see that um, uh, financial, financial services giant, uh, the likes of JP Morgan, had released their quarterly results, uh, which showed that um, their revenue, it came in slightly higher uh, than expected at uh, 50.99 billion uh, dollars, uh, in, in, com in contrast to 49.87 billion dollars, which was expected in, in, a, in a pool of economists. Uh, at the same time, the earnings per share, four dollars a share, um, uh, which is not compared to what you had before at four dollars nineteen dollars a share now the market will be looking out for um, Wells Fargo uh, Citigroup as well as some other corporates as well as some economic news which will be out for today now le now let's bring in uh, Washington correspondent Maria Bird with the summary of uh, Thursday's close on Wall Street 
The U.S. stock market rolled over on Thursday as the Dow Jones was up slightly at 0.08 percent. The S&P 500, though, was down at 0.88 percent. And the heavy tech Nasdaq took a major day of loss at 1.95 percent down. It is clear that many investors are wondering what will be next as they were hopeful after Chairman Powell's announcement that inflation was down. This is clear that there are major companies like Tesla and NVIDIA and AI companies that are having major sell-offs. This is causing some trouble in the U.S. stock market, but investors are continuing to watch for the next days and weeks ahead. Our Washington correspondent, Maria Bird, with the numbers on Wall Street for Thursday's uh, closing session. And from the United States, we fly over, uh, making our last final stop in Asia, where we see uh, mostly mixed sentiments for the close of Friday's trading session. Japan's Nikkei 225 led that loss, 2.45% uh, pullback, and that number is still coming back and forth, back and forth. And this is coming after the yen at um, hit, uh, uh, it firmed against the dollar, it strengthened, and this is raising concerns, uh, prompting analysts and traders to suspect that there will be a possible intervention from the country's um, Ministry of Finance. While the country's um, top uh, currency diplomat, Masato Kanda, uh, says authorities would take action if needed in the country's foreign exchange market. Now, for the cost, we see a 1.19% pullback at uh, 2,000, just uh, nearly 2,300, uh, 900. The Hang Seng Index, 2.59% in the green. And the other side of the market, the Shanghai and the uh, uh, Australia's ASX 200, they were also in a mixed picture there. So, any, that's it for the close of um, uh, Friday for some of the markets and from some markets um, intraday. All right. Thank you so much, Anita. Now let's head to uh, Berlin where it's going to be a football weekend. The final match of Euro 2024 is going to be in Berlin's Olympic Stadium between England and Spain. So you're in Nigeria, you want to watch your television. But Chip, I think we'll have a first-hand experience of that. But let's look at the business side of this. Chip, Chip what are some of the expectations? Thanks for having me. Any, the big winner of the tournament, believe it or not, is not the team that wins the match on Sunday. It is UEFA, the Union of European Football Associations. It is expected to make a profit of 1.7 billion euros. Now, most of that is from TV and marketing rights. While the tournament has featured brands like German sports retailer Adidas, most of the sponsors came from overseas, especially China. Chinese electric vehicle maker BYD was one of the tournament's main sponsors. It wasn't Germany's car makers, Mercedes, Volkswagen, or BMW. Now, the reason we saw a bigger shift to Chinese brands in particular this year has to do with the fact that UEFA decides for or against a sponsor. And it has two criteria money, and whoever is strategically interesting. Now, that explains why five of the tournament's sponsors came from China. I'm sure apart from uh, UEFA making money, you also be there to spend your money and have some fun, and we wish you all the best. Now, let's uh, come to Africa now, looking at uh, the issue of talent. I know this week on Business Morning, Ladi did discuss the issue of uh, retaining talent, and we saw Nigeria not doing so well. It was the list among, I think, eight countries on the continent at 14%, the percentage, uh, that's according to Handley and Partners, of uh, 14% retaining its talent. But let's make the most of a situation that may not look so good uh, with uh, Dr. Emmanuel Okeleji now. He's here in the studio. We want to talk about African talent mobility, how to make the most of it. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel Okeleji, thank you so much. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Great. So um, you are an HR person. Uh, you know, you are the co-founder and CEO of Simless HR. Yes. So you deal with talent a lot. Uh, we've cried about Japa. So we want to stop crying about it. We want to make uh, lemonade out of lime. How can we um, encourage maybe more movement, mobility of talent around the African continent? We're talking about after AFC, FTA. It doesn't just have to be with goods, it can also be with services. What can we do? We know that there are issues of um, visa requirements, traveling, 
payment. There's PAPS now. I don't know how effective that is, you know, within the co the continent and all of that. But how can we make the most of a situation that doesn't seem so good? Great. Uh, and again, thank you very much for having me. Uh, seamless HR, just a bit about us and then bring no, that to your question. No, you can't talk about you. You talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> bring that to your question. Because, yeah. you know, when different countries across the continent, so we have customers in all these countries who use our software to manage their human resources. So we see what's happening in, for instance, Kenya. We see what's happening in Uganda, Rwanda, and Tanzania, and Nigeria, in Ghana, in South Africa. So and one can compare between countries um, and within companies in those countries to see the impact of the movement of talent. Uh, and that context is very useful for this conversation. Um, Nigeria is obviously the most blessed con country in the continent in terms of human resources. We have so many people in Nigeria. And unfortunately, the Japa you referred to is sort of skimming off the top. The most talented people in the continent is what we're losing, um, although we have younger people. An example of something that happened this week, I was. Um, my background is in medicine, the doctor part is I used to be a doctor, and or oh, I'm still a doctor. <laughs> and I was hearing about uh, a very, very senior cardiothoracic surgeon who's leaving Nigeria um, and going back to the US. And then I read that the government is increasing the training of medical doctors, like medical students getting into medical school. Um, and it's going to take you at least 30 years to go from a medical student to that surgeon, literally 30 years. So if you lose that surgeon, we're going to wait 30 years to get those medical students coming through the door to be at the level of that surgeon. And, and so, yes, you know, the problem is a lot of problems. Um, yes, we do have a lot of people in Nigeria. Unfortunately, we also have the situation where those people are not very well employed. So the question you asked about the Africa Free, Continental Free, Free, Free Trade Agreement, um, visa freedom across the continent will help to tap into the full pyramid of the labor market. So that, you know, Nigeria, we have tilers who are making tiles coming from across the border. Um, but we don't have a lot of Nigerian talent crossing across the continent at the base of the pyramid. Um, at the top of the pyramid, unfortunately, we're losing a lot of talent. And, and there's significant work to do there to retain that talent in Nigeria. And uh, hopefully we have conversations leaders there um, today. Hmm, well, hopefully, because we are so short of time. But you see, I, I also noticed that the issue of virtual work yes. seemed not to have caught up uh, in, on the continent. So um, some people live in Nigeria and work for the US, you know, people school virtually now. Um, wh why do you think that's not catching on? Because I believe if we had something like that, then you could have the use of talent, you know, broadly on the continent and beyond, though, and then we still have our people. Absolutely. So there's a, there's a bit of that that's happening, and it's more around tech jobs in Nigeria, where you have a lot of, like, developers, designers, product managers who are living in Nigeria and working for American and European countries. I, I spoke to one of my former staff just two days ago. He says, oh, he's in Tanzania. So what are you doing in Tanzania? He says, just vacationing because he works for European and American companies. Now he earns USD. So there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a class of people who do that profitably in Nigeria right now. But where we can unlock it in a big way, so you look at India, for instance, places like Bangalore, where there's a lot of... Um, customer service jobs that are sitting in India, but these guys are picking up phones for customers around the world. And we have a unique advantage because one, we speak English in Nigeria, very good English if I must say. Um, two, we are at a position on the on the time zone where it's sort of like close to the GMT in such a way that we can walk shifts to the west and to the east of the world. So that's significant. And, and the encouragement here is that for governments and the private sector, and there are people already beginning to do work in that area where we can ship a lot of accounting jobs in Nigeria, customer care jobs, a lot of jobs that people can do remotely at scale beyond the, the, the young programmer or developer who is looking for a job for themselves. Hmm. So where do we start from? You know, <laughs> you manage talent. And I, I, I do not interacting with colleagues and it's not easy to manage human resources. Yes. But where do we start from uh, for the continent in this issue of maximizing our talent, even in the face of, you know, like the example you gave, greener pastures out there? Yes. You know, it's uh, Africa's contribution to global productivity is less than 3%. Um, and we have close to 20% of the population on the continent. That is a big issue. And in terms of where do we start from, 
we need to declare a state of emergency, if you must, on talent training and upgrading of talent in the continent. We do need to declare a state of emergency. Because what we have... What do you mean by state of emergency? Because we have a state of emergency on food insecurity. It doesn't change do we, do, do we really have a state of emergency? Well, it was declared by the president. No. Well, well. <laughs> so what do you mean by state, declaring state of if emergency? If we have 20% of the world's um, population in terms of human beings, and that population is growing, by 2000, we're going to have 40% of the population of people in the world. Um, but we have very, very low productivity... We have very low productivity. We have very low um, sort of quality of life for those young people. Is what's supposed to be a demographic dividend is going to become a disaster because if these billions of young people in Africa do not have a job and cannot live gainful, live gainfully, that's going to show up as famine. It's going to show up as wars. We have a lot of fault lines in the continent where. If, if things begin to crack, it will crack along ethnic lines, religious lines, um, economic lines. A lot of those things are just trouble waiting to happen. So a, a true set of emergency is going to be investing in training talent because human beings is raw material. It's training that converts raw material to finished goods. So we do need to invest seriously as a matter of emergency. And I mean a real emergency because this thing will crack if you don't do something about it. It's just keep giving back to people and you don't give them means to live and grow, something is going to give and it will give. It's not an if, it's a when. And so investing in training and converting the raw material to finished goods. Um, and Nigerians are some of the brightest people you can find anywhere in the world. And training people with the skill sets that are globally relevant. Um, and that's happening already in technology, but we need to do more work. I mean, not to the south, to the east and west, everywhere across right, Nigeria. So we need to do more work. on human resources and talent Absolutely. management. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, this afternoon, Dr. Emmanuel Kaleji, co-founder and chief executive officer of Seamless HR. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. All right, let's, uh, before we head to crypto now, let's just do coffee in Uganda. And uh, the sector right there has started preparing itself to fulfill the new European Union regulations on coffee set to take effect on July the 1st, 2025. And the new regulations seek to ensure that any coffee planted around 2020 in a deforested area is not allowed into the EU market. The regulation requires tracing of coffee from the garden to the market. And that, of course, uh, is believed that it will help boost exports of Ugandan coffee. From there, we move to Egypt, where asset liquidation seems to be the name of the game there, as that country aims to establish an asset liquidation committee under the Ministry of Finance with a goal to generate up to 25 billion Egyptian pounds annually for the state treasury from divestment proceeds over the coming years. The government had divested state-owned assets worth $5.6 billion two years ago since launching the initial public offerings program in March 2023. Let's head to the crypto space now and see what's happening right there, looking at the prices. Uh, well, we do have some headlines there, and that is that the Nigerian court will begin a trial against cryptocurrency exchange Binance over tax evasion charges. That story is not new and is set for October 11. The judge hearing the case has uh, made this known, and Binance faces counts of tax evasion, including failure to register with Nigerians. There you have it. And the other one uh, is Nove. Uh, Nove right there has partnered MasterCard uh, here in Nigeria to launch a new off-ramping solution that enables consumers in Europe to seamlessly convert their digital assets including cryptocurrencies, into traditional fiat. I'm sure um, this uh, laddie can feed on this uh, on Monday. So you want to get more details uh, since we see it uh, here in Nigeria. You know, the issue of uh, taxes on crypto transactions has also been announced. So we'll see how all of that goes. Let's see if we can have Rume, Rume Ofi now. Can, can we have... Can we actually go to the board? <laughs> All right. I wonder if we can have Rume, Rume, right there to see if we can touch on I'm any here, of here, this here. issue. Hey, Rume, good afternoon. We're almost out of time. but we, Good afternoon to you. <laughs> we just have to keep you. Are you excited about this? So we see this launch of uh, with uh, MasterCard, you know, to people can convert their digital assets, including cryptocurrency. Well, this is in Europe, but I wonder if you see this one day coming to Nigeria. 
Yes, I'm actually excited. A whole lot of things are going to happen right now in the industry uh, using blockchain as a base layer. But it's unfortunate that here in Nigeria, a lot of people see the industry as based on just cryptocurrency, and that is not what it ought to be. The banking infrastructure can actually build on uh, the blockchain, and uh, it's a welcome development. The, uh, the MasterCard is jumping on that in uh, the European Union. It's already happening in different parts of the world, and uh, we are supposed to be embracing that in no time. Uh, in respect of the fact that um, no clarity has come right now for uh, the uh, regulations here in Nigeria. Uh, the truth is that no one should blackmail cryptocurrencies. The truth is uh, the world is evolving and we have to move with it. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm wondering, Rume, that issue of um, taxes on transactions, has it started? Uh, no, exactly, but I, I think the SH platform are actually front running the system. But the truth is that uh, most likely it's going to be part of the licensing uh, requirement. It is a very good one. Uh, it's happening in different parts of the world, but a lot of industry uh, participants are not happy, myself inclusive. I and mean, this is an industry that the government care less about. The making it look like uh, it's an industry for criminals where people are playing very hugely in different parts of the world. But I think uh, industry engagement is very good so that we all can come up in the round table to discuss way forward. Government is going to also very benefit heavily and will be a heavy uh, population of unemployed youth, I, I believe, is going to create jobs for a lot of young people, and it's going to obviously improve on our economy. All right, Rube. Well, um, I, I'm not used to this kind of uh, Bitcoin. I have to tell you, it's been so boring these days. <laughs> we see. It. Yeah, the Bitcoin is actually, the yeah, Bitcoin is actually listening so to what's boring. going on. I don't know what's uh, going on. Economy. <laughs> any, any hope, any news when this boring Bitcoin will be out of our way and we'll have the more vibrant price movements? Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it doesn't have to go up always, but I think this is the point where we could uh, uh, have our thinking caps on for us to get involved in buying, maybe doing a dollar cost average and buying gradually. Uh, we're saying pitching the buying small, small. <laughs> yeah, buying small, small. All right, Rumi, thank you. We'll see how this weekend treats uh, a Bitcoin and, of course, the altcoins also. But thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Do have a great weekend. Thank you, Ini. Always a pleasure. All right, so we'll have to wish you two a great weekend, a restful one. I mean, I think weekends are for rest. You really need it because the hustle and bustle of the weekdays it make, make them, it makes that very necessary. Well, um, uh, tomorrow, Ladi will be here, Capital Market, 7 p.m., and then I'll be back on Monday. I intend to rest. Do rest, too. I'm Inijon Mekwa. Bye-bye.